Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Attorney Tom Fleming here for uh, Ro Roberta Boyle. Uh, it's an honor to be in front of this court today, and regardless of the outcome, I just want to say this uh, up to this date is a highlight of my career. Uh, to go forward, uh, I would like to address uh, specifically things that aren't directly referenced in my argument. Uh, uh, the trustee brings up the case of Spinelli. Uh, however, I, I would argue that Spinelli is a uh, its reliance on Kirby is misplaced. Uh, it relies on Kirby, which is a case that was decided by this court uh, regarding a tax exemption, which had uh, required strict construction based on public policy. However, in this case, we have the Homestead exemption, which as decided also by this court in Dwyer that it requires liberal, liberal construction. Uh, also, Dwyer is a decision of this court after Spinelli, which uh, essentially overturned Spinelli in its, in its interpretation of the Homestead statute, uh, its reliance on can I, ask you, can I ask you a question uh, about the nature of the, the trust here? Yes. What, what kind of trust is this? Uh, this is a trust that was set up to what I mean is, is it a nominee trust? Is it a, is it a true trust? What kind of a trust is it? It is not a nominee trust. Uh, the beneficiary does not have uh, the power to direct the trustee. Uh, it's uh, the, just a trust. Uh, the only raise of the trust is the real property, uh, which was created by uh, the debtor's deceased mother. And who originally. was the trustee at the time that the homestead... Uh, uh, the, the trust, position was declared. The trustee was Robert Boyle, who is the uh, Roberta Boyle's father and also an equal holder and only other beneficiary of the trust. So he was a trustee and a beneficiary of this trust? He was. Um, and did he um, file as trustee? File. Uh, For the homestead protection. Did he do it as a trustee or did he do it as an individual? He did not file. She the, did it, didn't she? Yeah, yes, she, right. she filed it. With, so, so how can a beneficiary who doesn't have the power to direct the trust do anything on behalf of the trust that would be in any way binding? Well, she's, she's not binding the trust. She's protecting uh, her interest from... As a beneficiary? Creditors. Yes, Your Honor. Well, if she had a 10-year lease with the trust to occupy that property, she could file a homestead declaration, couldn't she? Yes, Your Honor. And what kind of, a, of, of, a, of, a, of an interest did she have in the real estate? Uh, her interest in the real estate is, is, is twofold. It's, it's argued that uh, her... Uh, what kind of a possessory interest did she have in the real estate? Uh, first off, she's a tenant at will. And in addition to that, she is a, a beneficiary of the trust, which holds the real property. So, so her homestead declaration essentially relates only to her month-to-month her -month tenancy? Uh, no, Your Honor, I would say it also relates to her uh, beneficial interest in the trust because essentially it, it's, it's the connection that holds the property for her uh, to require it as a homestead. I, I, it, it's not direct, Your Honor, and, and I, I, I understand that, but that doesn't prevent her, in my opinion, from uh, reserving... Uh, in the state of homestead in her interest in the trust and the property held by it. Uh, it it's argued that uh, personal property cannot be uh, exempted under the, the two, 2007 Homestead Act. However, uh, in Section 2, when we look at the uh, execution of a homestead, uh, specifically refers to uh, manufactured homes and that a homestead for a manufactured home would have to be recorded in uh, the uh, clerk's office of the city of town where it was situated. Uh, that would, Your Honor, say that uh, personal property is subject to exemption under the homestead statute. Uh, additionally, uh, the trustee argues that uh, Spinelli uh, benefit uh, that this case at hand enjoys the same benefit under Spinelli where the beneficiaries were undisclosed. Uh, in this particular event, however, the, the beneficiaries were disclosed upon the execution of uh, the 
appointment of the new trustee uh, pre prior to the recording of the debtor's homestead exemption. <clears throat> and, Your Honors, uh, in my argument, I refer often to the new Homestead Act, uh, the 2010 Act, uh, not in that it applies to the debtor's homestead. Don't, don't you have to, uh, I mean, you, don't you have to live and die by the 2007? I mean, what was in effect in 2007? Yes, Your Honor, I, I do, and I agree to that. However, what I offer is that the 2010 statute <clears throat> reflects back upon the legisl legislative intent uh, when the 2007 statute was created. Are you suggesting it's a clarification, not an amendment, that it was their intent? It reflects an intent that the 2007 incorporates some of the terms that are specifically con contained in the 2010? At, at least in part, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it, as I discuss, it, 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 it's generally expansive. Uh, however, it does, it does have some uh, exclusions in it, uh, specifically when it refers to that in order to exempt a beneficial interest in the trust, it would have to be the trustee that records the instrument. And, and that's, again, required by the 2010, which doesn't apply to us. However, I argue that um, later in Section 5, when it uh, discusses previous uh, recorded valid homestead exemptions, uh, that they would remain valid despite the uh, execution requirements of the 2010 Act. Which Do, doesn't that require though them to have been valid when they were first done? In other words, it would have to be valid under the 2007 Act absolutely, in order Your Honor. to get grandfathered in under the 2010. Right? Yes, Your Honor. So the and other the, side says it wasn't valid to begin with. I mean, right. And the reason I refer to this section is because uh, the, their inclusion in the 2010 Act that those specific requirements of execution don't apply to previous ones. I argue that it encompasses that the way ours was ex executed was valid. Uh, I, I realize it's a, a little bit. Wasn't this language? Wasn't this language also in the 2007? I mean, I, I thought I saw something that's sort of a, a boilerplate goes into whenever it gets changed. Yes, Your Honor. Maybe, sure, maybe it was discussed in Dwyer. I don't know. I just remember seeing it in some other version of the statute. Is in the, in the 2007, if you're referring to uh, specifically a, an interest in uh, beneficial interest in the trust, it's not referred to specifically in the 2007 Act. No, I uh, meant the language about it, it, it preserves everything even if it wasn't executed the same. The, 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 the piece of the 2010 that you're relying on, I guess I thought that same kind of language had appeared in earlier versions of the Homestead Act. Is that not so? Uh, I, I believe it had, Your Honor, but not, not specifically refer referencing the execution requirements that are now on the 2010. It specifically, 2010 specifically has certain requirements that it says now these requirements do not, uh, like other statutes, if they were valid when they were made, they're still valid. And it goes on to say, notwithstanding their failure to comply with these <laughs> specific. So this, to say that the trustee would have to record it beforehand, I would say that's not necessary in that particular argument. Is That's why they put that in there in part. Uh, and going back to the language of the 2007 Act, I assume that you're relying upon the language of all who rightfully possess the premise by lease or otherwise, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And, 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 you're, the other, and you're the otherwise, because it's not by lease. Right. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, in addition to that, I would argue that the beneficial interest is also exemptable as an in, in owner, per se, uh, in one form. Uh, that statute does not uh, prohibit a beneficial interest from uh, acquiring it. But do, yes, but do you rightly possess by reason of the beneficial interest? Excuse me. Or are you suggesting, and when it's coupled with the possessory interest as such an at will interest as you have here? Yes, Your Honor. When, it, when it's coupled, it, it, it's essentially a, the whole package that comes together in the, in the beneficial interest. Through the whole course of this, is, is, this is where her home was in the whole intent of the trust was to pre protect essentially that. Uh, 
don't oh. we don't we have sort of going back to somewhere deep in the 19th century uh, language that the that this the possessor otherwise doesn't include or isn't construed to include equitable title like the Maddox case well uh, Yes, Your Honor, but, but in this case, in this particular circumstance, again, I, I refer to the 2010 Act where it does specifically include that a beneficial holder, uh, holder of a beneficial interest can exempt that interest. And I would say that it also included that in the uh, 2007 version, uh, at least under the or otherwise or uh, inarguably as an owner in the context of that situation. But I don't understand where, the, where her right of possession comes from, because I gather from what you answered to, to, to uh, Judge Link, uh, the trustee could say, I want to sell the property. I want you out. Uh, yes, Your Honor. I, I, I believe that is the case. I, but it's not. She is a tenant at will, although there, there isn't a written lease. She does have a right to possess that property to an extent. Uh, she, she could, they couldn't just go in there and pull her out and <laughs> lock the doors. It would have to be through the proper procedures of the Commonwealth to evict tenant. Uh, she, she has tenant rights in, in that sense. So then your view is that all tenants have a homestead right even if there's no lease? Uh, not necessarily, Your Honor, uh, but under, under the acts of 2007, I believe it could be argued that that is the case. Uh, to address the uh, issue of her, my argument that she is not only included under the or otherwise clause, uh, that she is also an, an owner in the sense uh, as applied to that statute. Uh, when I was in law school and we learned of property rights and real property and, and it was explained to us by Professor Lemelman, <laughs> who many of you may know, he, he was uh, quite known, but you referred to it as uh, you're holding a fistful of sticks of property ownership. And it's my argument that one of those sticks is indirectly in her possession through the trust. It's, it is a, not a direct relationship because her interest is through the trust. But again, Your Honors, uh, it's also falling under the or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If there are no more questions. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Stephen Weiss. I am the, with me is my colleague, David Weber. Uh, I am the Chapter 7 trustee appointed by the Bankruptcy Court to administer Ms. Boyle's case. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging the obvious. Uh, exemption statutes are generally uh, interpreted broadly in favor of debtors. Uh, and the homestead exemption is also uh, one of the most important exemption statutes uh, that we have in the Commonwealth. But I want to, I want to. And doesn't Dwyer essentially maybe dicta, but essentially say Spinelli got it wrong. I don't think so, Your Honor. It said, I think what Spinelli stands, I think the, the, what I was, what I think Dwyer says is the approach of Spinelli to be restrictive is wrong. maybe wrong, but the underlying holding it didn't address at all. Uh, and and that's, what, that's why I think Spinelli, uh, excuse me, Dwyer does not help uh, the debtor terribly much in this case. Uh, the thing that I think is a little less obvious in terms of the obvious points is that exemptions are creatures of statute. They are created by the legislature. There's, so far as I know, uh, no, nothing, there's no such thing as an equitable exemption uh, under the law. But that would go to the beneficiary aspect of it rather than the or otherwise possessory interest, right? I mean, the, this notion of it that it's not broad enough to include an equitable title, I mean, or are we saying that somehow a possessory interest of a tenant is an equitable title? I don't think it is, Your Honor. I think there's two responses to that. First, in the old statute, and I think everybody agrees, the, two, the statute that existed in 2007 right. is the statute that applies. 
Uh, owner is a defined term. Uh, it is an owner, sole owner, joint tenant, tenant in common. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the holder of a beneficial interest. Uh, and the second, and I think this, I, I think it was Judge, Justice Spina that started to ask about whether the debtor had an interest uh, that could be protected under, uh, under the statute. If the debtor had a lease that was for more than 10 years and can record a notice of lease and had an interest in the property, then, then the debtor could the, have exempted that, but the debtor but, doesn't have that. But the statute that. doesn't say it's only a 10-year lease or one that has a rep recordable interest. It doesn't, but it has to have, be a record. It has to be some legal interest in the property. And this was, I well, think... I mean, but the statute, I mean, if we're just construing the language of the statute, it says, or all who rightfully possess the premise by lease or otherwise and to occupy or intend to occupy. It doesn't say anything about it, it needs to be a 10-year lease or a recordable interest or any of that. That would go, it seems to me, to the, to the portion of the statute that goes to owner or owners of a home. But as to this other clause, this well, or, because well, that's the yeah, or, or, yeah, or otherwise, it's, it's, it may be the, it's the, I guess when we're dealing with statutory construction. Has, has this con language been construed? Um, it has in the Spinelli case, Your Honor. Uh, and going this back particular to section, I mean. this, the or otherwise, the and, or otherwise. Uh, and the appeals court in Spinelli actually said that or otherwise clearly dealt, went back to uh, a time, it was intended to go back to a time when one might not own the land but own the house on top of the land and, ta and take an interest in the, pos in the possession that way. And I think it was the Maddox, Thurston v. Maddox case from the 1800s. So it, that, actually, that was addressed in Spinelli. But what about, the, what about a possessory interest? Of, is, is there any decision that says that a tenant at will can never get a homestead interest in real estate? Tenant will I haven't seen well, occupy. Well, this court has never ruled directly on, on the homestead issue. I, I do want to add one thing to, about the exemption here in this particular case, Your Honor, because as I was listening to the issue about whether just possessing the property uh, could be exempt, in her bankruptcy schedules, which are at the, at the, uh, in the appendix at page 37, Schedule C is where she claimed her exemption. And all she claimed as an exemption at that time was, was her beneficial interest in the Westview Realty Trust, which it, it, holds title to the property. She did not claim an exemption in the possession of the property. But, but we're not adjudicating a case. We're answering a certified question. And the question is, may the holder of a beneficial interest in a trust which holds title to real estate and attendant dwelling in which such beneficiary resides acquire an interest in homestead in said land and building under Chapter 188, Section 1. I, I, is there a, uh, a, a, a homestead interest, a recognizable homestead interest in a tenancy at will? I don't think so, Your Honor. I don't think there's an interest in land. I think there has to be some interest uh, in a, a recordable legal interest in the, in the real estate. But, but the statute talks about a, a possessory interest. It doesn't talk about a recordable interest. It says one who, this is the, in effect at the time, uh, one or all who rightfully possess the premises by lease or otherwise. No, she doesn't possess it by lease. She doesn't possess, she's got a bare tenancy at will. I don't think there's any case that has ever said, gone so far as to say that there is an exemption and an exemption, that apply, a homestead exemption that applies in mere possession. Now, it may be that, because that that interest has so little value that nobody's ever claimed it as exempt uh, because that person could be, could be uh, tossed out of the property uh, in 30 days' notice. Uh, but there has been no case. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is a statutory scheme. And I think when the debtor says, uh, well, it doesn't say it's not allowed, therefore it should be allowed, uh, this court, I think, addressed that same issue, and I, and I think it was Justice Ireland in, in the Shamban uh, v. Meda's lover case, where the debtor attempted to say, there the, the question was, uh, is there a homestead, she had declared, declared, attempted to declare a homestead exemption for a disabled person. Her, her homestead declaration was facially invalid because it didn't have the right attachments. She tried to say, well, let's use Dwyer v. Semplin, which had, had come out since then. Uh, and, I and interpret this broadly, and the court said, no, there has to, there's a difference between interpreting a statute broadly and writing something into the statute that's not there. There has never been, there's never any, been any reference to any sort of beneficial interest in a trust and, and being exemptable, and all the case law that I've read, and I, I don't think there's any dispute about this, is that the beneficial interest in a trust, which is all that's being claimed as exempt here, is an is a personal property interest, not a real estate interest. If um, if we were to say that there is a homestead, that a homestead declaration, um, or that there is a homestead interest 
in a tenancy at will. How does that play out in bankruptcy, assuming that the person listed it in their schedules and stuff like that? If, it was pres if the issue were preserved in the bankruptcy? Court. Well, I think all it would do in the bankruptcy context is an interesting question. I, I think if that's all that the debtor exempted and, and could have it as an exemption. Uh, you have to live there is until the, the landlord the, the, Until him. the landlord throws him or her out. Now, if I had the, on the other, and if I, it, quite frankly, if I were, if the court rules in my favor and ultimately Judge Hoffman uh, enters an order in the bankruptcy court sustaining my objection to exemptions, I don't have the right, even as it stands now, to throw, uh, to evict or to throw out Ms. Uh, Ms. Boyle, the trustee of the trust, who happens to be her father, controls the possession of the premises. What I could sell, and, and, and I think I'm answering your question in a, maybe a long-winded way, but how it would play out, what I would have to sell or to administer in the bankruptcy case is her beneficial interest, which is a personal property interest, subject to her tenancy at will. And I, I wouldn't, I think the reason it doesn't come out very often is because a tenancy at will has so little value that nobody would claim it as exempt. Uh, really, really, what's going on do, here? Do you, do you value it? Could, I mean, I don't know enough about bankruptcy. I mean, does it? Is it your job to have to value what the tenancy at will is? In an informal sense, yes. Uh, my job as a trustee is to determine if there are non-exempt assets. If so, to turn them into cash in some way or another, and then to distribute them according to the priorities of the bankruptcy code. It, but, but does it? Do you, do you take into consideration such things as, well, the, the landlord is her father, he has a life expectancy of another 30 years, and he, it's likely that he will not evict her during that period of time? Is I, that I, something you would consider? Absolutely, Your Honor. In, in fact, the way that the, uh, the, these, by, by analogy, it's not uncommon where I'm a trustee that somebody comes into bankruptcy and they have a remainder interest in real estate subject to a parent's life estate. Well, we can value, A, we can value those things. Uh, by use of, uh, I usually use the tables from the Internal Revenue Code, uh, which value them for trust and estate purposes. And the second way that I value them is I put this, there's internet sites available for bankruptcy trustees to sell assets. And I, I've sold those, those interests on, uh, on the internet. So it, using that as an analogy to this case, if the objection were to be sustained, what I would end up trying to liquidate and, take, and, and what the market would have to take into effect and value is what, is the right, what are the rights that Ms. Uh, Ms. Boyle has to stay there as a tenant at will when there's a, a hostile trustee. What I would be selling is her one-half beneficial interest in the, in the trust, subject to those rights. Do, do you agree that under the 10,000, the 2010, geez, I'm way ahead of myself, <laughs> the 2010 <laughs> statute, absent the fact that it wasn't the trustee who filed this, this interest would be protectable? Yes. At, in, under the 2010 Act, which became, a, which became effective in March or April of this year, uh, the, the, st the legislature has now said the holder of a beneficial interest would be able to protect that interest under the Homestead Statute if the Homestead, if the homestead Declaration was executed by the trustee. Uh, in this case, uh, it, that, it doesn't, and, and I think there was some dialogue going back and forth, and I think it was uh, Justice Botsford who asked about the savings paragraph. Uh, it, the pa I think it's the very last section of the statute, which is at the appendix in page 13. It was section 3 of the statute that says, Essentially, any homestead that was good under the old act is still good under the new act. Uh, and, but it, and by the same token, if it wasn't good under the old act, it's not good under the new act. So, it, so under the new act, just to follow up with Justice Cordy, her father would have to declare the homestead. That's correct. Exemption. That, that is correct. And I think there's a good reason for that. And I think it also highlights why this homestead declaration would not be good. The debtor has admitted this was not a nominee real, not a nominee real estate trust. Um, if the court looks through the declaration of trust itself, she doesn't have, she, during the duration of the trust, all she has is the right to income from the trust. Uh, it takes a majority vote to terminate the trust, to sell the property, to uh, appoint a new trustee, all of these things. Uh, she has no rights. She's effectively a stranger to the, uh, to the real estate. Uh, and there's nothing in the Registry of Deeds that would suggest that Ms. Boyle has any interest in the real estate. And, that, and that's why, if, if, that's why I, I'm presuming that the leg, there's no legislative history with this statute, but I'm presuming that's why the legislature said a homestead declaration for somebody who, ha, who has a beneficial interest in the trust has to be executed by the trustee because it's the trustee that has the legal interest in the property, not any beneficiary. Can I ask you about it, that Section 3, uh, this part of it? It says, um, 
that it's all existing estates are fine, notwithstanding their failure to comply with the execution requirements of Section 5. Um, what, uh, to what does that refer, execution requirements, other than the trusts? I think it refers to the homestead itself, and in this particular case, to use a, uh, the simple, I, I think what it's intended to apply to is if there's a homestead declaration, let's leave aside the, uh, the specific issue in this case, but if there was a homestead declaration that was executed by an individual who clearly had an interest in, in the property, uh, and it was done properly in 2004 or 2007, and it, then it's still good, even though it might not apply now because for instance, now the homestead requirements uh, under the current statute require the identification of spouses, for instance. Most homestead declarations before 2011 do not have that. It would still be good. But if well, the only execution term that's actually used in Section 5 relates to home owned in trust. And uh, what you're saying is that if they did it wrong, in any respect, it's still okay. I don't really understand that. I, I read it, if you read all of Section 5, that the only execution requirement is with respect to home owned in trust. Thus, Section 3 really exempts Section 5 sub 4, if home owned in trust shall be a trust, uh, the trustee. So reading those two together, and viewing the otherwise as potentially including something that the only otherwise I could think of perhaps is encompassing what is now and clearly in 2010 would be, well, it's whole, held in trust and I live there, the combination of possession, primary residence, so you've got possession, primary residence coupled with beneficial interest. The only thing that needed to have been done is exempted by three because that's the only execution requirement under five. Well, I, I think Section 5, it covers all, it doesn't cover just the properties held in trust. I think sec, Section 5 covers all homestead types of declarations. I think it's the same sort of savings provision that, that was, uh, quite frankly, I think it was in the statute early, early, as far back uh, when Dwyer v. Semplin was decided because that, that same dialogue took place. Uh, and that there was the same comments under the court that if the, sec, if the statute was, go, was good and if the homestead was good under the old statute, it's still good even if the statute has changed. I think that's all that was intended. Uh, and section, subsection 4 of Section 5 does talk about properties held in trust. Uh, but I think the... the, the uh, it essentially means you don't have to re-record a declaration of homestead? If it was It'll a good carry homestead. forward. It, that's exactly... That, I think that's what that's, that provision means. Well, under the Bankruptcy Act, um, can, a, uh, can a, a declaration of homestead be filed and, and be valid or effectual after the filing of the bankruptcy petition? No. Okay. No, the, the rights that's uh, they're established as of the date of the filing. That's correct. The under a variety of provisions of the bankruptcy code, uh, but for instance, section 541, which discusses property of the bankruptcy estate, those are those rights are established as of the date of the filing. I, I, I explain to clients of mine that it's a snapshot of, of or, or a snapshot of one's life as of the date of the filing, uh, and the, and the bank with a couple of exceptions not relevant here. Uh, that is uh, the way the bankruptcy code is established. Council, your time is up. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I, I do appreciate the, uh, the time to, to have been here and to have made these arguments and then engage in the dialogue with the court. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a brief recess. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to take a brief recess. Well done. Thank you. You too. Nice to meet you.